Hello world, it's Siraj, and Monero is the currency that I'm going to talk about today. So first, I want to start off by saying one thing. I do not condone any illegal usage of any cryptocurrency. Monero is an untraceable cryptocurrency, and definitely lots of people who like to sell things illegally on the internet use it, but the reason that I'm talking about it is not for that. The reason I'm talking about it is because you should be able to control your data, and some of your data is transactional data, and currently, companies can mine that data for free and use that to make predictions about what you will buy and what you won't buy, so they can show you ads and stuff like that. But ideally, they pay you for this data, right? And the only way for them to pay you for that data is if you control it. And the only way you can control it is if it's anonymous, and they have to ask you for permission to see your transaction history. Okay, so Monero is the currency I'm going to talk about today. And I have this image here of this, these three different features that I thought was the best high-level description of Monero. So it says decentralized private and digital and Monero is all three of these things so it's decentralized because no one controls it it's digital because you can run it over the internet and it's private because no one can tell who you are when you send a transaction that means no one can tell who sent a transaction who you sent it to and the amount that you sent so it's all private unlike Bitcoin and these three um, kind of Venn diagram looking things are examples of assets or currencies that are examples of two of these, right? So Bitcoin is decentralized because no one controls it. It's digital because it runs over the internet. Um, fiat currency like the dollar is private because you could exchange it by hand. It's digital uh, because you can do it over the internet as well. And gold is decentralized because no one authority controls it and it's private because no one can tell, you know, if you just take some gold and give it to someone else, there's no third party involved. So no one can tell anything about that transaction. Okay, so Monero is all three of these things. And there are other cryptocurrencies that are all three of these things, but in terms of popularity, Monero is definitely at the top, right now at least. So let's get into this technical analysis of how Monero works. I'm gonna talk about all the features of Monero, I'm gonna talk about how you can mine it, I'm gonna talk about how you can buy it, and mostly this is a technical talk. So we're gonna go into the technical details of how these transactions are private and what differences it has from Bitcoin. Okay, so the first thing I wanna talk about is the difference between Monero and Bitcoin. So I've got this great uh, list here of all these different features that Monero has and all the different features that Bitcoin has and how they're different, right? Because they are very different. Um, some of them are very similar, like they both use the proof of work algorithm to secure the network. Um, they're both digital currencies. Um, they both have a transaction fee. However, Monero's is much less than Bitcoin's. I don't know what, what is Bitcoin's now, like $20 a transaction? Just crazy. That's crazy. Um, block time is um, much uh, faster from, from Monero. But the real difference here, the real key difference is the, the trackable factor. Monero is untraceable and it's unlinkable. Bitcoin is not. Um, I'm gonna go into the details of what I mean, like really into the details, so, so stick around. So, a lot of the hype around Bitcoin was that it's this, oh, it's, it's this pseudonymous currency, no one can, no, there's no third party involved, there's no bank, you own your currency, you own your data, you own your assets, but the, but the truth is that Bitcoin is very, very much traceable, okay? You can send Bitcoin by literally only pointing that transaction back to a previous transaction in the chain of blocks, right? A blockchain, that's the only way. And, that, and so your transaction, when you make one in the Bitcoin network, points back uh, to every transaction that came before it, all the way back to the Coinbase transaction. The Coinbase transaction is that transaction that occurs when a miner, and only a miner can make a Coinbase transaction, receives a reward for mining some blocks. So it's like Bitcoin that comes from nothing, but it, I mean, it comes as reward for uh, performing the proof of work algorithm, but right? So you can trace any transaction back all the way to the Coinbase transaction in the Bitcoin network. And you might be saying, well, how, how am I able to, to, to do this? Well, it turns out that you can look up any transaction in the blockchain explorer. So that's that. And this can be hard to do manually, right? I mean, say you send, send a transaction to somebody else and then they send it to somebody else, right? 
That's two links in the chain. It's easy to just go click once and then click once again on the Blockchain Explorer. But as nodes are added, the complexity increases exponentially, right? Because as those funds are split and then those funds are split and then those funds are split, it gets harder and harder and harder to tell where that transaction originated from. And if you don't believe me when I say that Bitcoin is traceable, just ask the founder of Silk Road, the online dark web market for selling illegal items. There are people literally sitting in jail right now because Bitcoin is in fact a very, very traceable system. Okay, so Silk Road, I mean, there's this whole story about Silk Road. They should definitely make a movie about it. Um, the guy was ordering hits on people and he was doing all this crazy stuff, which I don't condone and I don't think it's cool, uh, but he's sitting in jail right now. And they probably will and they probably have made a movie about it, but um, my point is that Bitcoin is traceable, right? Um, so. Yes, criminals don't want to use a currency that is traceable. Um, but, the, but the thing is, whether or not I make this video, criminals will find, a un, find an untraceable currency. You just have to type into Google, untraceable currency. If you wanna do bad, you will do bad, right? I am not making this video for criminals. I'm making this video for you. You are my viewer, right? I'm making this video for people who want to understand all the technical details of how cryptocurrencies work and then use this knowledge to then do good for the world, right? This is just knowledge in your arsenal to do good, okay? So just remember that as a motivation behind this video. So you could attempt to make anonymous transactions in Bitcoin three ways. So remember, Bitcoin is not anonymous, it's pseudonymous, meaning even if someone traces back your, the, the trail of transactions back to you, that is still your public address. That public address says nothing about your identity. It's not like the word Siraj is embedded in my public address, right? So how can you tell ownership? Well, there's a variety of ways, IP addresses, you know, um, finding the endpoints of, I'll talk about it, let me, let, me, let, me, let me show you this. So there are three ways to attempt anonymous transactions. The first way is to create a new wallet after every transaction. And Coinbase.com does this in, does this like by default. Um, but as soon as that money is used, the endpoint person could be squeezed for information, right? So if you send some money to somebody and you want to remain anonymous, you're creating wallets between every transaction. Eventually, someone is going to use that money in the real world for you know paying a dentist or buying a soccer ball or whatever, and then that is an endpoint person, someone, a real person that you know people with guns or whatever can say, "Hey, give me the information," and then they can trace it back to you. Another way is to wash your money through a tumbler, and a tumbler is a service that aggregates your money with many other funds and then sweeps them through large financial institutions. So if I send money to a tumbler service. Other people send money to that Tumblr service. Those funds are then aggregated together and then split up into little amounts. And then they're sent out through, through these different um, gateways, right? So it's very hard to tell who originated a transaction. However, in a court of law, this could be deemed supporting evidence for criminal intent by courts. Um, you could also wash your money, wash your money by purchasing assets, real world assets, you know, um, a basketball court, a house, a car, and then transferring that money back to Bitcoin or another currency and just doing that over and over again. Um, but that is illegal and uh, yeah. So these are all not good methods. They're possible methods, but they're mostly illegal and you will get caught, okay? So again, isn't untraceability only good for criminals? No. No, it is good for criminals, yes. So was PayPal in the early days. So was Bitcoin in the early days. Uh, but there are legitimate use cases um, for non-criminals like us, right? So distributed online payment vulnerability is an example. So Target, right? Target, the, the corporation, or um, you know any of these corporations, they mine your transaction data to then um, use it for predictive analytics to predict what you're gonna purchase and show you ads and other things to make you purchase things. This is your data, it's, it's very valuable. And as everything gets automated, your data will be the only agency you have in this new world. It will be the only value of, that you own, right? So you should be paid for it, right? And so if you understand where this is all going, you'll see that data is the most valuable asset we have, right? So watch my decentralized application video, just search decentralized application Siraj and you'll understand more about what I mean when I say just how valuable your data is. But the point is that if your, your transaction history is anonymous, then uh, they have to ask you for it, which means 
they have to pay you for it. And as you're getting these payments from all these different institutions for your data, you're making something like a basic income, right? Just from your data. And that's where we're headed. And that's the reason we'd want to use an anonymous currency like Monero, for example. Right, so if user visits an online shop, the online shop collects user data, and then an algorithm predicts purchase probability. You should be paid for this, in short. So let's, let's get into the technical details now, shall we? So the CryptoNote protocol introduced the idea of anonymous, not pseudonymous, transactions. So uh, it all started with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was the first implementation of an anonymous uh, currency. Right? It, was, it was the first implementation of the crypto note protocol. It's this white paper. And then there were some offshoots of Bitcoin. Right? So first Buddha coin, and then Paladin coin, Bullberry, and then Monero. And then Monero was the one that really took off. Right? Monero, I think, is number 10 right now on coinmarketcap.com. It's, a, I think, $7 billion market cap, so it's a lot of money. And all of these currencies that follow were offshoots of Monero. They were forks of Monero with added features. But Monero is really the most stable and the most popular of the anonymous currencies out there. Okay? So, um, crypto note transactions cannot be followed through the blockchain in a way that reveals who sent or received addresses. So, Monero is a version of crypto note that hides the sender, the amount, the transaction broadcast, and the receiver. So the sender is made anonymous through the use of what are called ring signatures, which I'll explain. The amount through ring confidential transactions, the, bro the transaction broadcast, like the location of where you are, your IP address, etc., through an I2P router called Covery, and the receiver through the use of stealth addresses. Now I'm going to explain how all four of these things work. Okay, so let's get in, let's get into this, right? So Monero has a lot of features. The two main ones that really matter that make it unique are untraceability and unlinkability. Unlinkability means if I have a public address in the Monero network, no transaction can be linked back to that public address. So anyone can take my public address and they could say, well, what transactions were sent to and from this address and no one will know. Untraceable means that no one can tell where any transaction originated from. So they're, they're two separate uh, descriptions. They're, they're very similar, but not quite. And I'll talk about each right now. So for unlinkability, right? So for unlinkability, here's how Bitcoin works. In Bitcoin, everyone has a public address, 25 character public address, and you use it to receive funds and anyone can see how much you received, right? Because it's a public ledger. When sending funds, you announce to the entire Bitcoin network that the funds you own now belong to the recipient's public address. So that transaction is fully public. The difference in Monero is this. So this is an image of, of a very high level image of how Monero works and I'll get into the details in a second. So in Monero, everyone has a public address like this, right? So it's a much longer public address. Um, hold on. And uh, unlike Bitcoin, your funds are not associated with your public address. So when you send funds to someone else's public address, you're actually sending those funds to a randomly created one-time destination address right here, the commitment public key. So no public record of sending or receiving funds. When I send funds to someone, they're actually sent to a one-time address. It's just created temporarily just for that transaction. And that's what's public. Not my public key, not, that, not, the, sent, not the receiver's public key, but that commitment public key. And so that public address will never appear, so your public address will never appear in the public record of transactions. Instead, a stealth address is recorded in a way that only you and the recipient can recognize the incoming funds. So when the recipient checks for funds, they need to scan the blockchain to see if any transactions are destined for them. So the recipient has a secret view key, which is used to check each transaction when they scan the blockchain to see if it was addressed to them. And because the recipient is the only one that knows the secret view key, only the recipient can see the funds that have been sent to them, right? So that's why when you launch Monero Wallet, it's scanning the blockchain to see if any transactions have occurred um, for you as a recipient. Right, so, but anyone who has your secret view key can also see what funds you have received. Right, so when you send a transaction, right, so it's an input, the output is gonna be this commitment public key, which is public, and then these two secret view keys, one for the sender, so I can see how much I sent, and one for the receiver, so they can see how much they received. But publicly speaking, there's just this one-time address not linked to either you or the sender, okay? And so that's the idea of stealth addresses, and what that does is it hides the uh, receiver, okay? 
Right. So um, it's also untraceable. So we talked about unlinkability, but it's also untraceable. Well, let me talk about untraceability. Okay. So for untraceability, that's where the use of ring signatures come into play. Right. So for ring signatures in Bitcoin, when you when you have an input, so some incoming transaction, right? It uses it's signed using a signature by some identity, right? And then all inputs are clearly linked to a previous transaction, right? So anyone can view this uh, input and say, oh, that's where it originated from. But in Monero, when you, when you receive an input, it's not just one input that you're receiving. It, there are several, and they're all linked together so as a ring. And all of these, uh, all of these inputs are signed using, uh, using what's called a ring signature. And then any input is going to be linked to more than one previous transaction. So no one will be able to tell who that input originated from because it's a part of a ring of transactions. Let me go into what I mean, okay? Okay, so here's what I mean by ring signatures. So the Monero money supply is divided into outputs, just like uh, the US dollar is divided into dollar bills, quarters, dimes, pennies. Monero is divided into outputs, divisions of currency. And these outputs store a certain value of Monero each. And the value they hold can change over time. So suppose that these are all the outputs that exist, and the one you control and can spend is highlighted in red. So let's say these are all the outputs, all the green ones, and I own this red one, number eight, which let's say is the equivalent of like, let's say $300. And some of these are like 200, some of these are $10 in, in Monero currency, right? And uh, when I create a Monero transaction, I'm using a ring signature to hide which input is actually being spent. So, and the way this is done is by making it seem like as, as if all the chosen inputs are the possible real sender. So when I send an input, when I send a transaction, there are five other transactions that are picked by random from other um, nodes in the network. And we don't need their permission to choose those. They're just there to obfuscate where that transaction is coming from. Right? They're all linked together in a ring, and they're all signed using a ring signature. So, so, so in the photo, your real input is red, and the five selected inputs are light blue. And these inputs can be controlled by anyone else. We don't need their permission to add their input to the ring signature. We sign them all such that an outside observer cannot determine which is the real one being spent. Right. And so once we have selected the other inputs, we need to finish creating the ring CT ring signature. So the ring CT ring signature is used to hide the amount that is spent. The ring signature hides the, the uh, sender, the stealth address hides the receiver, and the ring CT ring signature hides the amount that is being sent. So you sign it in such a way that all these inputs appear to be the real one used, and this signature includes several other important elements. So this is a more detailed view of what a transaction looks like in the Monero network. right? So when I make a transaction, there are up to six other transactions that are added to the, to the ring. right? All these rings, rings are signed using a ring signature, right? And importantly, very critically, a key image is created from all of these transactions. That key image is one hash, and it's given to the network as proof that the signature was created appropriately. The network verifies that this image has not been used before to prevent double spending. So it's got a list in the blockchain of all of these key images, and they'll look for a match. Has this key image been sent before? Yes. Okay, it's double spending, you can't do it. No, this is a valid transaction, go ahead. And so that's how double spending is um, prevented using the, the key image. Next is the Peterson commitment. So this is used to prevent other people from knowing how much is actually being spent. So it's a formula, right? So you have the actual amount that is spent, A, it's multiplied by a random number and this constant value here. And the result is this number that is a result of a formula and that, that is a commitment, right? You can use this commitment to commit to spending a certain value that only you have the authority to spend, but other people don't know what that value is because it's it's um, the result of this formula, right? It's not the it's not the original amount. It's a result of this formula, and that's what's public, right? So, um, it, so the Peterson commitment is a critical component of the ring confidential transaction or ring CT. It hides the actual value by adding a random number X. The commitment value is calculated for the set of inputs and outputs in the transaction and it is broadcast to the network. So that's what the network sees as the result of that, of that Peterson commitment formula. 
And, it, and so that all comes together to form the ring CT ring signature. And the result is an unknown amount of Monero being spent. The commitment public key is what's used by the network to verify that commitment that I talked about before. Right, so how do the outputs get used over time? So we can compare Bitcoin and Monero to find out, right? So in this theoretical history of the outputs we control, all the blocks highlighted red are the ones where the output appears. And if this was for Bitcoin, we would e really easily be able to tell that this output was transferred from user A to B to C. But with Monero, it's not so simple. There are three reasons for an output to show up in a block. Either it's new money and a Coinbase transaction, it was actually spent, or it was added as a decoy and a ring signature. I also want to talk about Covery, right? So we talked about how the sender is hidden using ring signatures. We talked about how the amount is hidden using ring CT. We talked about how the receiver is hidden using stealth addresses. But how about the uh, location, right? Like where you are, your IP address. And that's um, obfuscated using this um, I2P routing service called Covery. It's kind of like Tor, but basically your transaction is routed through all these different nodes, these internet um, uh, what are they called? These internet, invisible internet project nodes, right? I, I, I2P nodes. And these nodes pass your messages along and have no visibility over what is in them. And that's under construction right now. It's getting better and better over time. And you can view its progress on GitHub. It's all public and open source. But it's double spending proof, right? Because we talked about that, that key image that the whole blockchain has a copy of. And it's blockchain analysis resistant. Not completely, nothing is, but it's the most blockchain analysis resistant cryptocurrency that exists currently. And uh, yeah, so this is a huge high level, level overview of everything I've talked about. If you wanna go into more details, really look into this, but uh, yeah, those four components are really the, the key features of, uh, of Monero. Lastly, adaptive parameters. Like we said before, a Monero transaction has an ambiguous output origin, an unknown amount in a commitment, and an unknown receiver. So for every transaction on the network, all of the information stored on the blockchain is obfuscated, right? So let's talk about how to, lastly, I want to talk about how to buy Monero and then how to mine Monero. Okay, in terms of how to buy Monero, I've got this great link here. Um, it's in the Jupyter Notebook in the GitHub description, so check it out. But Changely is um, the best site I found to buy Monero. You can buy it using Visa or MasterCard. Um, there's, uh, you can buy it with Bitcoin uh, and you can buy it with even US dollar, if, if you so please, or Doge or all of these currencies. So definitely check out this website, Changely. And um, to mine Monero, I found this uh, really great uh, Python repository that you can clone in Docker. It's got the, all the Docker dependencies ready for Mac and Linux. You can run it and you can start mining it as well. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be awesome. But yeah, it, it wraps this JavaScript mining library for CoinHive that's kind of like this generic mining library for a bunch of cryptocurrencies, but it works with any Monero pool. So these are pools of miners based on the Strata mining protocol. You can set up your own pool. There's no dev fee, there's no ad block, and you can use any pool you'd like. But you clone this repository, repository you CD into it, you build it with Docker, and then you run it with Docker. Please subscribe for more programming videos. And for now, I've got to plan my scaling strategy for the new year. So thanks for watching.